Well, good morning, New Hope. Good morning. Hallelujah. We made it. Hallelujah. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I had a really interesting week, but I got to tell you, God is good. He works all things out. It was so interesting. I had a bunch of, I think, moments where I had the opportunity to lose my Jesus points. At least I can say I didn't lose any this time. Might be some other times where I might have lost a few. <laughs> but I didn't lose them this week. But I tell you, our God is awesome. And it's a pleasure to be able to come into the house of the Lord to worship him. Amen? All right. I see we got our family back again. Hey, y'all. They in the house. They visited. Hey. I tell you, our God is so good. And so... You know, every time we, we get up and we get ready to start prayer, you already know. We go, oh, and looks like we got another. Is that a, I don't know who that is, but that's, a, that's another visitor. That's your sister? Oh, sister, Al, sister. Oh, we know her. Hey. Good to have you in the house of the Lord. And so when we get ready to go before him um, in prayer, it's always wise and always on time to, to talk to him about the things that we need him to work on or to help us work on, right? I don't believe we can ever just step foot or wake up in the morning and we, how can we not think about something that we need to fix or do better? And so let's take this moment or two just to go before him and give him the things that are on our hearts. Some of us have been worried and fearful and anxious, you know, downright to the point of maybe we're not focusing on things that we need to. Maybe we're not getting the proper amount of sleep because we're worried or we're anxious. But don't you know that we can bring all of that to, to God our Father? Maybe we're short patience. Maybe we were angry. Maybe we said some of the wrong things. Maybe our, our minds have stayed fixed on like something that's irritated us. All of that stuff we need to bring him. Maybe we can't stop eating certain things. Maybe we can't stop doing certain things. I'm just smiling at the musicians. I like where they're going. But Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that we can bring all of these things that have hampered us. Some stuff has blocked us. Some stuff has frightened us. Some stuff has held us back. We want to give all those things to you. We've lost loved ones and we haven't gotten over it. We're going to bring it to you. All of our heartaches, all of those mind and mental aches, we're going to bring it to you. Maybe we were passed over for a job promotion. And we're going to give it to you. There's some things that have gone on we don't even understand, but it's a problem for us. But we know that you are the problem fixer. You are the heart and mind regulator and we're going to give it all to you we're not going to put the wrong things in our body anymore we're not going to do the wrong things with our body we're going to give it to you and ask for you to heal us God in the name of Jesus we're not going to harbor wrong thoughts against people we're not going to stay irritated and aggravated with them because guess what if we hold ought or we remind somebody that or we might remind ourselves that we have a fault with that person well what do we want God to do when we go to him and ask him for forgiveness so we can't hold people hostage and not forgive them that's not Christ like and so maybe what the person did was wrong maybe what they said was wrong maybe they backstabbed us we're going to give it all to God and ask him to take care of it for us right and so God we thank you for Jesus because we can ask for forgiveness every single time we can ask for forgiveness and we have a new slate that's what our God does I know I, I'm grateful for a do-over I like do-overs thank you for a do-over it's good to be able to have a do-over and so we bless you for Jesus, God. And now we talk to you, oh God, about who you are to us. 
And if you could just begin to say some sweet nothings to God, just fill the atmosphere. Tell God who he is to you. Let's just not think about him quietly in our heads, but let's begin to release those things. He's our father. Tell him who he is. I usually tell him I can't make it without you and that there's nobody besides him. I tell him it don't matter what it looked like, that I still love him. And sometimes stuff looks a little shaky, but it don't matter what our eyes see or what our senses experience. God is still our God. He's still able. He's still able. He's still able. When you're laying on that table and you're taking that last breath, I know many people have been counted out on the emergency room table but they weren't gone but God our God has the last say so he's holy and he's righteousness he's fair he's forgiving that's a good one he's patient he's all powerful all knowing and he loved us so much he gave us Jesus there's no big brother like Jesus Jesus guaranteed us a seat in heavenly places but not just in the heavens that we have victory here in the earth realm we have health and we have strength we have life because of Jesus and so now we lift up the names on this list we have Andy Brown and Willie Smith Jaquan Williams Akeem Thomas Tiana Easterling Craig Phillips Camilla Ganey Brenda Bezier, Nicola Levy, Shanitha Williams, Monique Bynum Ford, Renetta Gaines, Tamia Spells, Kenny Harrison, Reginald Jenkins Jr., Onitha Jarrett, Allison Wortham, Tamara Jones, Mary Walford, David Robinson and family, Devin Hill, Bernice Malachi, Ashley Smith, Deaconess Pamela Jackson, Sister Angela Wilcox, Miss Powell, Henry Bullock and children, Jerry Blake, I guess that's Mae Bullock for keeping power, Michelle Bullock for her job, Marva Jarrett. I'm going to throw Chaz Fountain in there. Nothing's wrong. I just want to throw her in there to get the, get the prayers of the saints. And so many of the people that we have lifted up, they are members of this house. And so, God, we thank you for a diagnosis of perfect health over those on this list that need their health prayed for. We thank you that what would appear to be masses and cysts and all kinds of interruptions, that there would be no interruptions. We declare, oh God, that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are our healer, oh God. You also are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. And so, Father, we thank you that you are mind regulator, God. And we thank you, Lord God, that dementia, dementia and Alzheimer's and anything that would come to attack the mind has no authority. We say, oh God, that you have authority over drug abuse and drug addiction in the name of Jesus. For those of us who are in want of love, you love us all the time. That we would be healed in those hidden places, oh God. That we would be delivered. And so God, do what you do as no one can do, oh God. And we thank you for the answer, for the victory, for the good report in Jesus' name. And now we lift up the bishop of this house, we lift up Bishop Donald Johnson, the angel of this house and his wife, co-pastor Lisa Johnson, and we bless them, oh God, in their absence. And so we say that we miss you, but we thank you, Lord God, that you're gonna enjoy your traveling. And for Sister Ariel, Lord God, bless them and God, bless the family that's still represented here, oh God. Bless the children that belong to the union, oh God, and to the grandchildren. Bless them, oh God, with finances, God. We thank you for Junior, especially, oh God, and his job. Thank you that he has more than enough. Junior, I don't know, but there it is, God, in the name of Jesus. And so we thank you, Lord God, for our bishop and for the co-pastor, our leading lady. Give them peace, oh God. Bless them as they leave this house in the name of Jesus. Thank you that we will continue to go in the right direction because we serve under a people who love you, Lord God. Leaders who love you and have been sold out to you. And so now we lift up the children of this house, Lord God, and we bless them in the name of Jesus. 
I need for everyone to point their hands at one child, somebody, somebody's child. And so if they're not here, we're going to call their name. Even Jermaine, he's not here, but we call his name. We thank you for all of Sister Tamara's kids. I don't see them, but we thank you for all of them, Lord God, and for the Jones kids that are here, Lord God, and for Anthony, Lord God, for all these children, for Skylar, and I believe it's another Ariel in the name of Jesus. Every child that's represented in this house, we declare that they are your children, oh God, given over to you. Give them success academically and spiritually, oh God. Let them dream dreams. Let them come smack dab into the face of you, oh God. We thank you that they would not be given over to another God. But we thank you, oh God, that they would marry the people that you said that they would marry in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the people who would teach them and come into contact with them, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And we bless them. And so, God, we thank you for their parents and for the members of New Hope in the name of Jesus. And we bless you, oh God, for the people of New Hope. We say, oh God, that we are a house of love, oh God, that we are deliberately healed. We are healed, set free on a daily basis. But this is the house of love. And so, God, we thank you that we walk into our purpose in you, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And that we prefer you and we prefer others over ourselves, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We know how to love one another, Lord God. We thank you for those that you would send here, oh God, that they would be able to be planted and stay here, oh God. We thank you, Lord, that not a witch, not a warlock, not a Jezebel, not a python, not an antichrist, not a wolf, not a hireling. None of those demonic forces would be able to come up in here and stay unless they be healed and delivered, oh God. Now, before we pray for the leaders of this house, point your hands at these musicians and bless them, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Because it's not easy to play the worship music for the Lord. Don't you know that they come under attack because they bring us into the presence of God. Now, bless them, oh God, and let their enemies be at peace with them, oh God. Bless their marriages and partnerships, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for their health and strength in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, we thank you. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the leaders that have been placed in this house, that we're given over to you, oh God, and we know how to help the man of God do his work. We follow directions real well. We know our place, and we keep you, God, first. And so we thank you, Lord God, for the leaders that we are delivered, that we continue to be healed and set free and that we continue to be delivered, oh God. That we study to show ourselves approved. And so we bless the name of the Lord. Now we lift up the woman of God that would deliver the word of God today. We thank you for the anointing that would be upon Minister Alexis as never before, Lord God. We thank you that she would flow, oh God, in the anointing, oh God. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Have your way, let her preach like she has never preached before, oh God. Bless her, oh God, and let her enemies be made her footstool. We thank you for her husband and for the children, oh God. Bless this household. Thank you for the house that they're getting ready to buy, oh God. Thank you that you're going to make everything smooth in the name of Jesus. Now let her preach as never before. People of God, say preach as never before. Bless this house, oh God. Have your way in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Is he? 
shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. We are free. No more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. How many of y'all free in Jesus? I think that's a good reason to give God some praise, isn't it? No more shackles and no more chains because we are free in the Christian life, the, the life that we live. We don't have to worry anymore because God has the final say so. I think we should all stand up for that. I think we all should stand up for that because without God, where would we be, right? And I just think honor for God giving me the opportunity to be here today in the absence of Bishop and Co-Pastor Johnson. Um, I thank my colleagues over there. Hi. For um, allowing me to tap into my turn. It was funny, um, I was laying in my bed watching my favorite show, it was about eight, nine o'clock. And I get a text from um, Lady J saying, tap, it's your turn. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. But yes, yes, I'm, I'm definitely honored to be standing here today. I'm, I'm so excited. It's Palm Sunday. I'm excited for Resurrection Sunday. I'm excited for what April's going to bring. I'm excited for 2022. And even though uh, a lot of times we go through so many things, I know that God can see you through it. And so if you can, turn with me to um, the book of Romans. It's going to be quick. The book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 18. Let me know when you got it. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, if you don't. Okay, so Romans 8, verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And I'll say that again, because I don't think you caught that. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And you guys can have your seat, right? So what does it mean to find glory in suffering, right? What does it mean to, to find meaning in suffering? Because I think a lot of times when we find meaning in suffering, it helps us along the way. Finding meaning in a time of suffering seems like a redundant thing to do when all hope is lost. Trying times never disclose an expiration date. Trying times never seem to disclose what's going to happen next. We just know where we currently are, but not where we're going. 
It can be very difficult to find light at the end of the tunnel when things are so dark for so long. And suffering can be agonizing, traumatizing, stressful, unhealthy, toxic. For some, unhappiness and depression. For others, it brings sadness, and both can become tormenting. But why do we as Christians have such a hard time surviving dur during the suffering? It seems because better always seems like an easy alternative to freedom. Does better sound like heaven when things are bad? The thought of doing better, being better, feeling better takes control of our mind. And it's so easy to forget the why, the reason to the suffering. If things could just get better were a record, I think we all will be playing the same song over and over and over again. Better always seems like the best option, but skipping steps during the process of suffering only benefits the flesh and not the spirit. When we talk about suffering, we must look at what the author of the text was going through during the time in which he wrote the scripture. We know Paul, who used to be Saul. He was a Christian killer, ain't Paul had his life planned out. He was a Pharisee. He was well-educated. He was a Roman citizen. He was out there persecuting Christians left and right. So Paul, he was good. He was good where he was at, and he didn't know what was going to happen on the road to Damascus. Unbothered by his struggles of what a Christian goes through, he was good where he was at. But according to the Bible, it says after he became a believer and a follower of Jesus, he was arrested three times and spent a total of five and a half years in custody, either waiting for trial, held in prison, or up until the day when he was murdered. Performing miracles, preaching, and setting people free cost Paul his life. He was beaten, he was attacked, he was in prison, he was persecuted himself. Suffering became of Paul's life, and he never once complained. Better yet, he encouraged us to find glory in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character of hope. It sounds like you and me, right? We changed our lives, we get saved, we go to work, we provide for our family, we do what we have to do, we go to church, we pay our tithes, and then boom, here comes trouble. Trouble seems to find us, and we don't understand why when we're doing so much good, why does the evil keep following? Well, Romans 7, 21 tells us, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Suffering day in and day out. My suffering may be different from your suffering, but it's still all the same thing. We're all going through something, and we can't pinpoint why. So I had to look at something that, that really intrigued me, and a lot of people... To me, this was, this was mind-blowing, right? So DMX, one of my favorite rappers, he passed away last year, if y'all didn't know. He quoted a German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche, and he said, to live is to suffer. To survive well, that's to find meaning in suffering. Finding meaning in suffering is the only way to survive and actually live through it. And so I have to give you a few points in order to let you understand how can we survive during the suffering, right? So knowing who you are in Christ is very important. A lot of times we forget who we are during the suffering period. We were created by the image of God. We were put on this earth to sit in heavenly places and a little bit lower than the angels. That means that we have more authority than we really think we do. Before we were even born, we were set apart and chosen. That means that we can stop certain situations from happening and other ones we can at least command them to be still. It doesn't mean that because we got bills that are piled up, we have doctor reports that keep telling us we're sick, we're in bad relationships, we're un unemployed, underemployed, it doesn't matter. We can still dictate where we stand in God by believing in his word. It's important to understand that as a child of God, we have first right to everything. So we have to remind ourselves that God wants the best for us, and despite what it looks like, God can't turn it around. Romans 2, 8 and 28 tells us that, and we all know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It's your purpose that has been called you to suffer. But if you do not know where you are, then how can you consider it joy? So I can remember a time, right, when I was sitting at the Salvation Army, and, you know, I, I 
was hearing what the people were telling me and day in and day out they would say you know you're never going to make it you're never going to over accomplish this what you went through in your childhood or what you're going through in your adulthood that's just who you're going to be but it took for me to stop and realize who I was in the child in Christ that I realized that I'm better than this and I can overcome this and that nothing that these people can tell me can dictate where I'm going it changed my circumstance at that point because I stopped complaining and I stopped wondering why me and I stopped wondering why these people keep telling me this and you know that's what the enemy does he tries to trick you into thinking that you aren't who you say you are and if you don't know who you are then how can you defeat that so it's so important that we understand that our current situation does not dictate who we are right so I didn't have any parents they said I was a bad mother they said I was broke they said I was busted and disgusted, but I knew that I was a child of God, and no matter what it looked like today or at that day, it doesn't matter who I am because look at me now, years later, and I can overcome, and I've overcome the circumstances, and I'm standing here today proud to be who I am as a wife, as a mother, as a minister, as a, as a student going to college. I'm doing all these things because I didn't allow what they said to dictate where I'm going, and it's so important that we know who we are in Christ. And we have that conversation with God to know that no matter what they say, you are somebody, right? And so it's funny that when we talk about who people are, whether it's yourself or someone else, we always mention the length of their hair, their body shape, their eye color, their financial status, maybe even their title. But we never seem to put purpose on the end of the sentence. We never seem to put where Christ fits into all of this. And being blind to what God sees in us, it stagnates you from where you're trying to go and cripples the outcome of your destiny. And so it's just important to realize that you have to have that self-talk to know that no matter what, I am somebody. And it's hard to hear the truth because a lot of times we've been for so long told that we can't be something, that, that you were stupid from when you were a kid, that you were a menace to society, that you went to jail so many times that you can't get a job. They tell you these things because they want to keep you crippled, not because of who you could be, but because of what they see you as today. And so you have to understand that you are who you say you are as long as you say it. And so it's important that we mold our minds into what Christ is saying. And we have to just tap into that to say, it's already in me. So tap your neighbor and say, it's already in me. And tap your other neighbor and say, it's already in me. I don't have to go looking for it because it's already there. Right? And so it's just important that we keep following the truth because the truth is what sets us free. And as long as we look in the mirror and remind ourselves each day, what Galatians 4 and 7 says, it says, I am no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Do y'all know what an heir means? Because I don't think you understood, caught that. An heir means that I, I'm, I'm sitting in princes and palaces and royalty. An heir means that I have access to everything that God's kingdom says. Heir means that whatever the Bible tells me, I can do. So we have to stop letting these things that are in life cripple us and allow us to see that God said that I'm something else, that I'm better, that I can open up that business, that I can start that school, that I can apply to that job, that I can finish out college, that I can do the things that God told me to do because he said so. So we have to, we have to we really remind ourselves of who we're listening to and who we're talking to because we are fearfully and wonderly, wonderfully made. As a king's kid, we sit at the table the table that God presents to us, not the table that we think we want to go to because our friends are doing this and our friends are doing that and she's doing this and he's doing that. No, the tables that God said, the ones that you might not have been qualified for, but you can still do it. Those are the tables we're talking about where financial freedom becomes, where spiritual freedom becomes, where we don't have to worry about the next thing because God's in control. And that's why it's so important for my first point to say, know who you are. We are the head and not the tail the lender and not the borrower. And my circumstances don't d dictate where I'm going, but it's given me a lesson while I'm waiting. You gotta have confidence in Christ, and that's so important. A lot of times we don't know who Christ is, so we don't know who we are. And a lot of times we've grown up and matured, and we're in our 20s, we're in our 30s, we're in our 40s. However old we are, we never really took the time to figure out what does God see in me. And that's my second point. 
You have to lean not on your own understanding. A lot of times we lean on what we see, which we then put as an interpretation of what we understand our life is. So now, who, you know who you are, but it's important to know where do you stand. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You will never understand life by way of the world. Repeat, you will never understand life by way of the world. You can't look at men, you can't look at your circumstances, and your own way of thinking to think that this is what it's supposed to be. Everything must be consulted by God. Take time out of your day to really meditate and ask God, where should I be? Where am I going? What should I do? What should I say? Those are the things that I'm talking about. He's the only one that can give us insight and give us the understanding that we desire. We always want to know why, but we never ask. A lot of times we cry, why me? Woe is me. Why this? Why that? But we never consult God on the why. So the why is getting the understanding to know that God is in full control. Circumstances try to confuse us on what God is saying. A lot of times, for example, you can get fired at your job and you think God is punishing me. I was working there for 20 years. Why I'm not working there now? When little did you know, six months from now, God has you opening up your own place. You have to understand that God has the better say so. And just because we see things in one way doesn't mean that that's God's lenses and we have to look through his eyes and not our own. That's the reason why he gives us this Bible right here. So we can know which way we have to go and what we need to do. That's the answer. A lot of times we go other places and get connected with the wrong things. And that we think is our Bible, but it's not. We have to give God the access that he deserves. Proverbs 2 and, two and 5 says, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, you will seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the, find the knowledge of God. That means that we need to be putting our ear to God every day. That means despite what it looks like, whether you, you have kids, you have to get up in the morning. Whether you have work at third shift, you still have to find even five minutes of free time to give it to God. Understand it comes with faith and the action of seeking God first. Your attitude towards suffering can easily be shifted from woe is me to God, I thank you anyway. And thanking God for what he's going to do, because even in the suffering, there is joy. You know, a lot of times when we're going through something, I realize that it's very, very hard to say, God, I thank you. I know personally myself, I went through that situation where I was, had some legal issues and I thought it was the end of the world. When I say I thought it was the end of the world, I thought it was the end of the world for me. And I had to realize that at, at a point a few months down the line of complaining and crying was that this isn't going to get me where I need to go. I have a big God that can help me in this situation. I have a big God that can do what needs to be done even though I made a mistake. I'm not saying that I didn't do wrong, but what I'm saying is that God is a redeemer. I'm forgiven, and I'm able to go to God and say, I'm sorry for what I did, and I need your help. God isn't turning his back on you because you made a mistake. And so we have to understand that no matter what we do, God will never turn his back on you. And I remember I came to church so angry, y'all. I mean, so angry. And then I sit up front. You know how that looks to just be sitting there, frowning. Everybody's clapping, singing, and I'm just sitting there mad. Mad that people are happy. Mad that people are clapping. Mad that I have to put on a fake smile every day. Until I realized that, no, God is going to do what he said he was going to do, just like the song. So I should be joyful in that. I should be happy in the fact that God is going to help me out no matter what it looks like. And even if it doesn't look like how I planned it to be because it didn't work out how I thought, it doesn't mean that I'm going to die in it. Sometimes we have to live in what we dealt. And the cards that we play, that's the cards that we get dealt. And that's just the way of life. But it's about accepting the circumstance and moving on. You know, and I, even, even the other week I had, we had, um, I put diesel in my car, y'all. I put diesel in my car. $40 of diesel turned into almost $1,500 to fix it. And I could have sat there and said, why? Oh, my car. No, I had to really just deal with what was going on and move on. Because me wallowing in what it looked like, 
I'm not even joyful that I had the money to fix the car. And that's kind of turning my back on God because he gave me the funds to fix it. But yet here I am complaining about the situation. And I'm learning that in everything that we deal with, we complain without looking at where the, the answer is. The answer was in God. And I'm learning more and more and more each day that God has the final say so. He always makes it work when you're faithful to him. But it's about continuing through the suffering, right? And so after a year long dragging out with that situation on my legal case, I learned that patience, silence, and praise were my answer. See, I had to be patient and wait on the Lord because the, the case got dragged out for so long. I had to silence my murmuring because it was causing me to go into depression. And then I had to have the praise to thank him in advance and say, God, I know you're going to do this for me. And he did. But it was about waiting through the process. And at least I found some joy at the end because I'm like, I'm tired of complaining every day about this. There's nothing I can do. So I have to just move along with the process. And a lot of times that's where we learn those lessons and the suffering. Whether we cause them ourselves or not, we still have to learn the lesson. And the lesson is that God is going to have his way. And in the meantime, it's preparing me for where I'm going. A lot of times, the majority of the times, we try to put things in our own hands. And that's what causes unnecessary turbulence, right? That's the turbulence where we cause things and shake things up ourselves without even thinking about it. So this is going wrong, so I'm just going to make this go wrong, that go wrong, that go wrong, and that wrong, because I don't care at this point. At this point, God doesn't care, so I don't care. That's the mindset that we put in our heads sometimes. At least I know for me, I've done that. And, you know, I learned that there's necessary turbulence. That's the turbulence where God is shaking up some things because he's pressing me out so that I can be made anew and so that I can learn things so that I can be able to grow and help somebody else so that I can be a stand-up Christian woman and I can be a good wife. But see, we don't want to go through that process. We want to just take, take this step first without even realizing what's down here. And see, we have to understand that we don't know which way we can go, but we can only use Christ as our light. And so that's the which way that we should go. But it's important to understand that we have to allow God to do what he needs to do. And we can't just keep making our own decisions without even thinking about God first. A lot of times we give up, and that, and that can't be the option for us. As Christians, we are fighters, and we are conquerors, and we are more than what we say they think they are, we are. And so now that we know who we are, we're leaning on, our own, on God's understanding. Now we need to know that trusting Christ is in the process, right? So when we trust God over your life, that means that you give everything to him. That means not just a little bit, not just some, not just a corner, only this part. I'm talking about the whole shebang. All the things that we don't want anybody to know about. Those are the things that God needs to handle and uproot up out of, out of our lives. And once we become saved, we know that things have to be made right. And so some things need to be added, some things need to be subtracted, but either way, God gets the positive. Trusting God will fix what we hold on to until better happens. And it's easy to confuse hard times as God's absence, but it's really the opposite. That's when God shows up. Hard times is when God shows up. See, a lot of times we think he's not here because this is going on. He's not paying attention because I'm dealing with this. And it's totally the opposite. God is actually working in our favor. And we can't continue to play the blame game on what we don't see. A lot of times we, we think we're supposed to be further than where we are. Things should be better than the way that they are. But we have to trust in Christ that we know that he is going to handle things the way that they should go. So that the end result will be what his, glorifying his name. Trusting God through suffering is one of the most challenging obstacles to overcome, but it's possible. You can live through it, so why not find joy in it? Why, want, why would you want to wallow in it? when you can find joy in it. And a lot of times we miss that mark when we're dealing with tough situations. But God didn't intend for you to die during the storm. So why not just put your umbrella up and wait for the rainbow? And it's so crazy because I remember when I came to this church, right? I remember I was maybe mid and late 20s. I was living my best life. You know, when you first get saved, you're still doing what you like to do. And... It took for my mom to pass away, and then my aunt to pass away, and then for me to lose the house and to become homeless, that I realized that God was standing there. The whole time that even though I was mourning, God was helping me grieve. And it took for me to end up at these front door of this church on 33 Grand Street to understand that somebody was there for me, and it was a man named Jesus. You know, I had to trust who God was because at this point, everything had been taken away from me.
I had no mom. I had no dad. I had no siblings. I just had my two small kids. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to say trust the process or trust Christ when you're not going through something. Because you got all the faith in the world at that point. You can live on top of mountains. Everything is good. But it's in the moments and when things are so dark that you can't see the light. That's when God shows up. And I remember coming to this church, getting saved, and things turned around. You know, I'm standing here today, 10, 11 years later, being able to preach the gospel. Why? Because I stuck through the process. I trusted Christ even when I had nobody to call on. See, when God, sometimes God will mute people, and you think, I could call this person, call, and they don't pick up the phone, and you wonder why. That's because God is calling you to call him. And he's showing you, I'm, I'm right here. Where are you? Because I'm waiting for you. And so I'm understanding that you have to learn that God is with you and that no matter what it looks like, nothing can stop you from getting the love of God. And you're not standing here just for no reason. You're not listening to me just for no reason. You don't know where I came from. Some of you do, some of you don't. But the importance to know is that I'm still standing here even through the suffering, even through the times when things didn't get better. Even through the times when I felt like I just wanted to give up and I was done with this church. Not because the church is something to me, but because I had a lack of faith. Because I was so sick and tired of what I was going through that I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And a lot of times we sit back and we wonder, why me, why me, why me? Well, why not you? See, now I have a story to tell. Now I can talk about the things that people don't want to talk about. Now I can have an understanding with my brother and sister in Christ who may be going through the same thing that I'm dealing with. But it's so important for you to understand that God has a purpose and a plan for you. So that's why you have to know who you are and lean on God's understanding because Christ is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is there with you every single day, whether you think he's not or he is. God is the ultimate price and that's why we are celebrating today on, on Palm Sunday because without Jesus I would know I would be nothing I don't know about you but where I came from the streets of Hartford they, they'll wipe you out and I'm lucky to be standing here today I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I have my husband who's standing here today because without him where would I be where will my children be but yet it was Christ who kept us together it was Christ who kept me standing it was Christ who got me to walk through these doors even when I want to I remember when I was taking the bus here every single day I remember when I didn't have two cars or, or a home I don't remember when I was purchasing my first house I don't remember anything other than where I'm at now because before you don't even understand where I was coming from I was homeless I done been to jail I've been on drugs I miss I've been going through so much that nobody can understand but you see me today I think I look mighty fine I don't know about you and we come here to celebrate Jesus Christ because Jesus has done such an amazing thing in my life but not only has it done it for me I know that he can do it for you I know that each and every one of you standing in this room today have an opportunity an opportunity today to see where God is gonna take you and no matter what your circumstances are looking like we know that God can elevate you and take you to the next level but it's about trusting that process and it's about leaning on God's understanding and it's about knowing who you are in Christ despite what your circumstances look like and despite what it looks like just know that you have a friend in me and if you ever need a phone call I'm, I'm just a, a minute away oh wait and so if there's anybody out there who's not saved Lord God forgive me don't beat me if there's anyone who's out there who's not saved or is looking for a church home, the same doors that I walked through 11 years ago, the same place that I had needed a friend and I found family members, even though they're not biological, you can come up to the front now. And even if you're not in the room and, and you're not ready to, to make that commitment, at least come up and get saved. Make sure that you're covered under the blood because we don't know when Jesus is coming. And we don't know when the end date will be, but you'll know because you walked up here that you are covered under the blood. And even if that's not for you and there's someone online, just know that there's an email, there's a phone number listed that you can call and contact us to either join the church or become saved or even be, get prayer. Either way, the doors of the church are open.
And I know it may seem like it's a tough time or a circumstance where this may not be the reason or the rhyme to, to make that commitment. Trust me and trust God. He can't lead you anywhere, any way but the right way. A lot of times we get this thing confused and we think that God isn't going to help us. And why would he help me? Why would he help me? Because he loves his children. I'll give you another minute. Okay, so I guess it's time now for tithes and off offering. Okay, so you guys can get the basket. And our cash app is on the screen if you need the cash app. We also, the prayer offering as well. And Father God, I just thank you right now for giving us the opportunity to tithe to your home. Thank you, God, for just giving us the opportunity to have the funding to be able to bless this church, God. We give this money unto you, God, because we know what's best, and we know that it will be handled delicately. We thank you, God, for everything that you're doing, and we thank each and every person that's gave. And if you couldn't, God, we ask you to bless them as well. In Jesus' name. And uh, Trusty Marvin has the uh, basket for gift and grace, and Trusty Shirley has the tithe and offering.